This is all theater. This is all just political theater. Political theater. Political theater. Pure political theater. Theater. Political theater. The nefarious, significant, and protracted political, political, political theater for political theater's sake. I yield back. From Washington, this is Political Theater. Roll Call's review of the spectacle of politics on Capitol Hill and across the country. I'm Jason Day. There are not a lot of resumes that read like Bill Bradley's. Gold medal Olympian, Rhodes Scholar, pro basketball player, author, senator, presidential candidate, radio host, and now a documentary film storyteller. His latest project, Rolling Along, premiered last June at the Tribeca Film Festival, appropriate for the iconic New York Nick we're about to talk to, and it started streaming on Max on February 1st. Bill Bradley, welcome to Political Theater. Thank you very much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Of course. Uh, we're happy to have you. And uh, I, we were just uh, off mic. We were just talking uh, that uh, I'm I'm joined, as I frequently am, by Roll Call's political editor, Herb Jackson. Also, he, he is a longtime Jersey political reporter and, and a native son of Jersey. And uh, you guys are talking about a book signing. I know we're going to get to the movie as soon as possible, but I want to I want to have a little bit of this for our listeners about the interaction between the two of you at the was it the Paranus Mall? Is that Paranus. the I said that right? Paranus. 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 There are many yeah. malls in Paranus, or at least there were. And the, on a Friday before after Thanksgiving, you just didn't want to go anywhere near Paranus because everybody else from New Jersey was there. But somebody was doing a book signing. And as a political reporter in 1998, uh, when he when that somebody was a potential 2020 2000 presidential candidate, I had to go and chat up his fans about whether they wanted him to run for president. So I had to deal with finding a parking space, <laughs> the Garden State Plaza in, uh, in uh, so. Senator, this sounds like your typical aggrieved voter. What do you think about that from New Jersey? <laughs> Well, no, he wasn't a voter. He was a member of the press who didn't want to work that day. Let's face it, you know, he wanted to be home with his family like everybody else. <laughs> Thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, again, for, for most people who uh, listen to this podcast, I'm sure they're at least familiar with some aspect of your career, but you served three terms as a United States senator, as a Democrat from New Jersey. But, you know, again, as I mentioned at the lead in, your career, you know, started long before you got into politics and it has continued uh, since since leaving. And I just want to kind of get right into the the, the film itself before, right. you know, we, we talk about, the, you know, kind of the politics and, and so forth, all this yeah, stuff, sure. other stuff. And, you know, Rolling Along is started as a as a project that you were working on. And now it's it's on Max and it's a documentary film. So let's talk about how how you came to this why you know why you felt that this story needed to be told in this way because you're also as i said you're also a uh you, you write books uh you're probably one of the few members of congress or politicians who actually write your books uh <laughs> uh and uh it, like let me let us tell us a little bit about how why this project and why now sure well i gave my political papers to princeton and they did an oral history and they interviewed about 60 people and I then invited all 60 to a reception. About 40 came. I stood up and told stories about each one of the 40. And one of whom was a guy named Manny Eisenberg, who is a friend of 50 years and has produced 72 plays on Broadway. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, sounds a little bit like Hal Holbrook doing Mark Twain. You ought to work something up, right? So for the next year, I wrote the script, and uh, I then took it to 20 cities around the country and workshopped it. You know, I'd go to the subscribers from the Zach Theater in Austin, Texas, or the Marin Theater in uh, California or San Diego, or a law firm in Chicago, uh, and I would uh, read it and then say, what do you think? And people would offer their opinion, and I'd take notes, and that's how it evolved. And I was going to do it on the stage, uh, in a theater, uh, you know, try to be there for several, I don't know, however long it would be, and do it every night. And then COVID hit, and uh, that's it for the theater. And so I then decided I'd morph it into a film. But the thing about it is uh, 
angels appeared along the way. Uh, you know, the first angel was that when I did it in that 20 city thing uh, and the commissary of the Warner at the Warner Brothers lot in Los Angeles. And a guy named Mike Tolan came up who did The Last Dance and said, you know, I think this could be a film. So that logged in my mind. Right. And then uh, when when COVID hit, you know, I, I had to you know, the question was, I asked someone, do I have to memorize this? And they said, of course you have to memorize it. If you're going to stand up and do it on the stage, you've got to memorize it. So I was walking around Central Park, talking to myself and muttering and memorizing it. And um, I then uh, I, I saw my buddy Spike Lee, uh, who I'd known for a number of years. He was, you know, he helped me in 2000. And, Maybe the most famous New York Knicks fan yeah, on the planet. Yeah, and I said, hey, Spike, I've done this thing. He said, well, come on over and do it for me in Brooklyn. And I said, uh, great, I'll be over. And he said, well, what do you need? And I said, how about a, a, ice, a glass of water and a stool? And so I did the whole thing for him. And I found when he had tears in his eyes, I thought, well, you know, something connected here. And um, then I did it for, then I, once you've memorized it, you have to do it every day. You can't let a day go by. So every day at 3.30 in the rec room of my apartment building, I did it and uh, got around. And sometimes two people show, sometimes five, sometimes 10. And uh, sometimes actually got to 14 at one point. And I said, that's too many. And so it got down to four again. And one, and one day, two people came in, one of whom was Frank Oz, who oh. is the great director of all Jim Henson movies and uh, the voice of Yoda. Yeah, Yoda in Star Wars, exactly. Fuzzy and afterwards, bear. he said, you know, I'd like to help you. And so he helped coach me and uh, at the same time offered editing notes. And so angels along the way. And the last angel that appeared uh, was two weeks before Tribeca. And uh, I had opened the song, opened the, 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 the play with a Van Morrison song called And the Healing Has Begun. And then two weeks before, his agent called and said, Van doesn't give you permission to use this song. I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? So I called my buddy Steve Van Zandt of the E Street Band, who I'd sent a version of this six months before. I said, Steve, I need a song. <laughs> well, well, Bruce uh, did a song in the early 80s for Clarence and me called Summer at Signal Hill. That might work. So I got it and it worked. And I said, terrific, I'll take it. And he said, well, Bruce and I sold our uh, catalog to Sony two years ago, so you got to get approval from them. And with Bruce's agent, John Landau, and friend help, I got permission from Sony. But the point is, all along here, well, there were angels that appeared along the way that helped me do this. And you ask why I, I did it? I think I did it. I realized afterwards when I had jettisoned the the, uh, the Van Morrison song that the song was okay, but I really did it for the title. And the healing has begun. And I would hope, you know, that this could have a healing effect uh, on people who see it in our country today. We had such a divided time that maybe this will help people see the common humanity that we all have. Uh, so that's the why and the how. It I I um I hadn't thought about the Mark Twain part of it. I my I immediately thought of Spalding Gray uh, because yeah. of just the sparseness, the you know the glass of water, the table. Yeah. Um, uh, but the the Mark Twain of it is is interesting too because there is quite a bit about growing up on the Mississippi River. Uh, you're you're exactly. I mean, you're you're always associated with New York uh, and New Jersey for many people, but. Uh, you know, you were born in, and raised in Crystal City, Missouri, which is right on the banks of the Mississippi. And that's actually a metaphor that you continue to come back to as it was a metaphor for Twain's life as well. Yeah, no, there's no question about that. Uh, the river is always a metaphor in my life. And um, so I grew up right next to it. And absolutely, you were exactly right in saying that. And I was, you know, I was formed there. There are a couple of themes in the, in the movie one is uh, belonging, right? And uh, I grew up in a small town. My father was the local banker. It was a factory town. I wasn't like the factory workers' kids. I was different, right? And then 
I took a path down to become an evangelical Christian at Princeton, which was a pre preeminent secular university. I also felt different. I was an evangelical in that climate, which was, I didn't feel I belonged. And so, you know, the first time I belonged, I felt was when I was with the Knicks and we were, at, we were unselfish and we had a great communion of, of uh, people of people who became close friends for a lifetime. And so there's that theme too, of belonging throughout uh, the, the play. And I suppose that um, uh, one of the themes is what my uh, grandmothers told me, or she said, never look down on people you don't understand. And so, you know, in a world where we're living in such a divided political world right now, I think back and maybe maybe people could learn from what made our Nick team successful so many years ago. Like take responsibility for yourself. Respect your fellow human being. Disagree with them honestly and civilly. Enjoy their humanity and never look down on somebody you don't understand. To me, that's the message of the film in our divided times. And I know Herb and I were discussing a little bit. Like I actually was not familiar with your um, your, your time as an evangelical Christian, uh, and you know, there's this very raw moment in in the in the film uh, about uh, uh, the question of abortion. And and I, I know Herb, like you, you, uh, I'll I'll throw to you on this because, um, you, you know, again, you're your, it's your time. I've talked enough. <laughs> I, I I don't remember that coming up during your campaign for president. You know. No, some of those, it has never those come up anywhere yeah. under any circumstances. But if I was, the key thing to healing, I think, is you have to be honest about yourself. And by being honest about yourself, you get some credibility so that other people can see their lives in your life. And then you can begin to stitch back together that, uh, that common humanity that's been rent asunder by political division. Well, you know, you, you start by quoting your grandfather sitting on the porch in his rocking chair talking about, I think he said he was a, a German immigrant. He was a German and immigrant. That, yep. that, that he, he, what he liked about America is that it's free and people care about each other. Exactly. Is, that's what he is that me. still true? I think that's still true. I mean, okay. we're clearly free. Uh, and I think people still care about each other. Yeah, I do think that. Apart from all of the, uh, you know, brittleness of our politics, which leads to division, right? I think people recognize, and I wanted this film to underline that, that we all share a common humanity. I mean, we all have, we have children. We want them to have a good education. We want them to go on and advance in life. We want to take care of our elderly parents. Uh, we want to be fulfilled. We want to be in love. We want to have, uh, you know, a, a chance to have health. So, yeah, I think that I do think that what my grandma, grandfather said about, you know, the key of America is it's free and people care about each other is still true. I mean, look at, look at the people that get a Social Security check every month. That's all of us telling them we care about them. Right. That's that that's great. You, you're you're blessedly not getting the same emails that I get every day, uh, because <laughs> it, it does seem that it's it's what it is now is someone else is keeping you from getting what you want. Yeah, that's and that you is need to support this person or oppose that. Yeah, person. I think that uh, of course um, you're kind of a target for those kind of emails, right? They want to complain to someone of those kind of people, right? And so that's fine. Um, but I don't think that that uh, takes away from the common humanity, you know. And and the key thing is finding, uh, and, and quite frankly, you know, we did a focus group about this film. Had 50 people from around the country, all over, all ages, all ethnicities, races, etc. And then we cut it down to 15 people and did a focus group. And they were asked, well, what is this film about? And they said, it's about all of us, right? It's about love of the game, love of the country. And as I said, you know, pers perseverance, forgiveness, 
These are values of sadness and joy. These are things that are deeper than our political uh, debate allows today because we don't take the risk to go deeper. I wanted to take the risk to go deeper. And that's why I had to tell the truth about myself in hopes that it would get other people to tell their stories. And I believe if I if this encourages other people to tell those stories, then I believe that's going to be a positive thing because it'll be in those stories we'll find common ground. One of the, one of the things I was struck by this week, uh, Senator, was that the, the you know they had the uh, uh, national prayer breakfast uh, earlier this week and. We have some photos, you know, of our our uh, from our staff, from our roll call staff uh, of Mike Johnson uh, and President Biden sitting next to each other, and not just sitting next to each other in the way that it can be awkward between two politicians. <laughs> um, even even senators from the same state sometimes, <laughs> right, <laughs> can be awkward next to each other. Uh, but uh, it, it seemed like, I mean, just again, maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into this, but you know, there's there's the there's the email that like Herb is referring to of you know they're trying to take away your freedoms, they're trying to you know make you do things you can't do, they're trying to restrict things. And then there's this actual this person to person contact between Biden and and Johnson and and like you know two different generations one you know silent generation one Gen Xer one evangelical Christian one lifelong Catholic one Democrat one Republican and it actually seemed that there was a warmth in the way that they were talking to each other and and interacting with each other. Granted, it's a prayer breakfast, but it's uh it it seemed like there's this just this two two sides of politics where the thing that gets you the money is really pissing people off. But then there's the this commonality that yeah, we don't well, see as often. I mean, I think you you put your finger on it. I mean, and there it was vividly displayed. These are two human beings, right? From different political persuasions. And if they get into the narrowness of politics, they will be battling each other. But as human beings, and the key thing is get us to step back. I mean, for example, uh, I mean, uh, you know, um, your parents, your coaches all said to you when you were growing up, I'm sure, as they said to me, when you lose, congratulate your opponent, right? And they said that when you were in sports or in politics or whatever. And, and you know, and, and people, you know, you had to act out of honor and not out of grievance, right? And you ought to have, and you ought to know that with humility and hard work, that you can achieve excellence. And that's how you take care of your family. And if enough of us achieve excellence, the country moves forward. And it's these these levels that uh, we need to have our politics talk to. And I mean, I remember when Cory Cory Booker was elected the senator from New Jersey. He asked me, well, "What should I do?" And I said, "Make five Republican friends, real friends." And so he started going around to senatorial offices, Republicans, and visiting with them and getting to know them as human beings. And when he visited, uh, I think it was a senator from Oklahoma named Inhofe or something like that, uh, he found that he had an adopted child, right? Because there were pictures on the wall. And Corey then was going to do a bill about foster children. And he went to Inhofe and said, could you be a co-sponsor. He said, yes, I'll be a co-sponsor. And he got Republicans to support it. It's now the law of the land. But that came out of relating to someone's common humanity. And uh, so I I think on one level, uh, the divisions are real. On another level, I think they're uh, superficial. So, Senator, along the lines of New Jersey senators, in in the movie, you talk about being backed by Billy Musto in the nineteen seventy eight. Here's the deep cut <laughs> yeah. in the nineteen seventy eight primary. Yeah, I and was. We, yeah. we we know what happened to Billy Musto. He went to prison, and we he know did. He became yeah, he did. mayor of Union City after him. And he's now the U.S. senator from New Jersey, and he's under indictment. What what do you what do you think Bob Menendez should be doing? Should he resign? He's got to be. He's got to make that decision in his heart. That's that's got to be his decision, in my view. 
Um, you know, I, I and I'm not deeply involved in this, so I only know about the gold bars and about the whatever the cash or whatever, which doesn't sound good, right? But uh, you know, people are entitled to a day in court, and so let let him have his day in court, and it'll come soon enough, and then he'll either be uh, uh, innocent or guilty, depending on what a jury says, or a hung jury. As it was with his last indictment. Senator, we've uh, only got a couple uh, couple more minutes uh, before we need to cut you loose. But um, as I said, this is the film rolling along is uh, streaming on Max. I, it, it's really hard for me to say that. I really just want to say HBO. Uh, no, no offense to the people who are providing you the platform, <laughs> uh, but it's on Max on February one. Uh, are you are are you are you tempted to take it on the road again, uh, possibly, or just let the film speak for itself for the time being? Because it seems like what comes through in the film is that you are enjoying yourself, uh, and and when you when you talk about it, there's a sort of a, a lift here. I mean, is this tempting, or are you are, are you already working on the next thing? Uh, I I was. Um... I remember sitting in the room before going out to do it for four nights, right? My analogy was the locker room. I was going out to play, right? And then, of course, I did it, and uh, then the film was made. And I remember at dinner once I had with Bette Midler, and I said, hey, Bette, you ought to go back out and do these concerts. And she said, do you ever have any idea how difficult that is? (laughs) And so the point is, yeah, I had a lot of fun doing it. But you know that means every day I gotta have I gotta have a pregame meal. I gotta take a nap. I gotta do this, and so my guess is I'm probably not gonna go back out and do the whole thing. I'll never say never, right? But there it is, uh, in the best of all possible ways. I mean, you know, I've had tremendous angels, as I said. I mean, guys like Mike Tolan, Spike Lee. And Frank Oz played a gigantic role. All those people out there who offered their opinions when I would do the readings. And um, it, it's kind of reached a completion. That's it, you know. Uh, you don't rewrite the book, right? Now, this is performance, but uh, I, I'm, I'm actually having a little fun doing these sub stacks, which uh, I didn't know anything about until we started trying to promote the film and they said we well, ought to do a sub stack I said what kind of sub what sub what is it I don't know what it is and they said well you know so figure out what you want to write to make it a short so I've I've written some sub stacks one of which is uh you know why I did this which we've had a conversation about and the other was 10 things you should look for when you go to a basketball game right to an NBA game and the other is 10 things I liked about the Senate and I just did 10 musical memories right, of a life. And uh, I'll, I'll give you one musical memory that I that I just finished writing about. I just sent it in. It'll be in starting on Saturday. I'm in high school. I'm playing the trumpet, but I'm not good. And the guy who's the band director is also <laughs> the study hall teacher. And so I, uh, I'm in study hall, and he motions to me to come back and talk to him at the desk. And so I go back, and he says, Bill, let's assume you were a coach of a baseball team and you had three guys who could play shortstop, but you needed a second baseman. You didn't have a a second baseman. What would you do? And I said, well, I would move one of those three guys to second base. And he said, Bill, that's right. Would you agree to give up trumpet and take up French horn? (laughs) And that... And that's how I became the tallest French horn player in the high school marching band. <laughs> wow. So this is, again, something I did not know about you, but the French horn. My my mother plays the French horn, and I'm a, also a I, – I didn't want to say this at the top because I didn't want you to think that I was, you know, buttering you up for the podcast, but I am an only child who grew up in a small factory town in ranching town, Cottonwood, Arizona. I played basketball my entire life. <laughs> Oh well, there we are. I am. I am not a Knicks fan. I am not a Knicks fan. I will say that I am a Phoenix Suns guy through and through. Uh, They were they were my team since. uh, But uh, but and then I was a terrible terrible trumpet player. (laughs) There we are. (laughs) There we are. So this this is the first, right? (laughs) 
maybe we could have a, well, maybe we could form a little uh, orchestra with the French horn section from old trumpet players who gave it up but found joy in in, in the French horn. <laughs> Well, Senator, thank you so much for talking about uh, this project. Uh, you know, that we we could we could go on. You, uh, you and Herb could just talk about malls in New Jersey probably for the rest of the, the rest of the afternoon. Yeah. But we know we got to cut cut things short. But again, rolling along is playing on Max. It started uh, streaming yesterday. Uh, all all listeners should ch- check that out. And thank you again for your time. Thank you both very much. And Herb, great to see you again. Yeah, yeah. Well, we covered Hudson County and Bergen County, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a difference. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take care. All right.